All right, so let's do a quick uh, session on pilar and sebaceous lesions. <clears throat> like before, I'm going to record it, but I can always edit out anything that is needed. Um, all right, so we got what? How many cases? A bajillion? 37. So 37 cases and one hour. Let's do it. So no descriptions, just tell me what you think it is, because it's an intermediate level now, right? So so I know you guys know how to describe stuff. So what did you guys think this lesion is? Sebacioma. Yeah, I would call it a sebacioma also. It's nice circumscribed lesion, and it definitely has sebaceous differentiation. Nice vacuolated bubbly cells with lipid vacuoles that indent the nucleus. Sometimes flipping the condenser helps you see them better, like so. And then the majority, over 50% over of the lesion, is made up of these relatively uniform basaloid cells. Um, you can have mitotic activity. In fact, I'd say you usually do. But you shouldn't see pleomorphism or atypical mitoses. That would make me think more of a sebaceous carcinoma. The distinction can be challenging sometimes. And the difference between sebacioma and sebaceous adenoma, as you guys I'm sure know, is that sebaceum is supposed to have more than 50% of these blue basaloid germinative cells um, and less than 50% of the mature vacuolated sebocytes. And sebaceous adenoma is the opposite. It's got a majority of vacuolated sebocytes and um, less than 50% of the blue basaloid cells. I think that distinction is very arbitrary. And to me, sebaceous adenoma and sebacioma are just probably two ends of the same spectrum. So that's the way that I think of it. Okay, that's case one. How about uh, case two? Ooh, I tried to wipe these slides, but okay. Uh, fibrofolliculoma. Yeah, this is a nice example of fibrofolliculoma, relatively rare bird in my experience. These often occur on the nose or elsewhere on the face. And they uh, have a central follicle um, that can be dilated like this. And then these little strands of kind of blue basaloid epithelium stretching out from that cystic structure in the middle. And then the key, the fibro part of the fibrofolliculoma, is this right here, this dense fibrous stroma that's made of kind of plump spindle distillate fibroblasts and dense collagen and basically this is kind of recapitulating the adventitia that special dense fibrous layer that wraps around normal hair follicles because remember hair follicle tumors like most of the nexal tumors they're recapitulating or mimicking the structure seen in the normal um, the normal tissue of that type and so you can tell that this this stroma by itself up close may not look like much right it might look like fibrosis of any sort but from lower power, you can see that it's definitely a discrete nodule of that stroma. And you can even tell where it separates. Like right there, look, it's got this nice cleft that it separates from the surrounding normal background dermis. I find that a very helpful feature, not just in this entity, but really in a lot of the benign follicular lesions. They have their own stroma, and their stroma usually looks very distinct from the surrounding dermis. And I find that really helpful um, to make the diagnosis. So that's fibrofolliculoma, and what's the syndrome that if you have multiple of these? Bert Hogg Dubé. Yeah, Bert Hogg Dubé uh, syndrome. People get multiple fibrofolliculomas and trichodiscomas. And I don't have a good example of trichodiscoma to show you because honestly, I'm not totally sure if I believe that it's a real thing. And I know greater and smarter people than I'll ever be have described it. So who am I to say that? But basically, anytime I see something that I think the idea is trichodiscoma is mostly this follicular, I mean, this dense fibrous stroma with just a few little strands of kind of follicle stuff in it without this central actual like cystic follicle. But I feel like every time I want to make a diagnosis of trichodiscoma, it ends up either on deeper cuts being a fibrofolliculoma or it's actually just a fibrous papule with a hair follicle embedded in the middle. I feel like it always ends up being one of those things that I never find something that fits perfectly. So I don't think I've ever seen a real case that, that I was convinced of trichodiscoma that I can recall. Um, so in any case there, that's my, that's my thought about it. 
uh, for the day. So if you ever see something that you think looks like a fibrous papule, an angiofibroma, with an unusual follicular structure in the middle, think about trichodiscoma or fibrofolliculoma. Number three. This looks like nevus sebaceous. Yeah, it's as classic as you can get, right? The epidermis is acanthotic, and in my view, it looks kind of like a seb or a wart, seborrheic keratosis or verruca on the surface. And then if your patient is not, if they're in puberty or later, they'll usually have these big sebaceous glands that are mature and that open, unlike normal sebaceous glands, which open into follicles, these sebaceous glands open directly to the surface of the skin, which is abnormal, right? And uh, that's a perfect example you can see right there. And then the other thing that you'll have in some cases, not always, is the presence of either apocrine glands, like right here, look at those beautiful apocrine snouts and apocrine glands or apocrine whatever name you whatever word you like they have these like very nice round nuclei with prominent nucleoli so that's one way if you can't see good snouts and you're wondering are those really apocrine go look do they look like little eyeballs like little minion you know the little minion cartoons like the one with the one eye uh that's what someone on instagram told me that once they're like it looks like minions and i was like oh they so do and i think that's really fun so in any case um the other thing is that in nevis sebaceous you don't always have um, full-blown apocrine glands. Sometimes they kind of have an overlap. They look like eccrine coils, but with a little bit of that apocrine nuclear change or snouting, the decapitation snouts, you know. Um, and uh, that is, those are called apoecrine glands. They kind of have an overlap. But I find that really useful because apocrine glands normally are where? Like the anogenital areas uh, around the nipples. You can see them on the, the eyelid margin, the glands of mole. M-O-L-L, -L, those are uh, modified apocrine glands, if I recall. And, um, and so in any case, if you see on the scalp uh, apocrine glands in the dermis, you're probably dealing with a nevus sebaceous. And some nevus sebaceous is not as floridly papillomatous. Sometimes the um, sebaceous glands are not as big and well-developed, particularly in kids or that are before puberty. And the other thing I find helpful is here we're on scalp with these huge antigen hairs with their roots down in the subcutis. And then all of a sudden, the hair is gone. No hair, no hair, no hair. And then on the other side of the lesion, the hair comes back. And that is analogous to what you see clinically, that you see this greasy kind of warty plaque without hair growing in it usually. So I find the lack of hair in, the, in a scalp region, which is the most common site for nevus sebaceous, I find that lack of hair to be very useful actually in making the diagnosis. As you guys know, you can have a wide variety of adnexal um, proliferations and neoplasms that arise in the background of nevus sebaceous. Um, and... Um, Rarely you can have carcinomas grow there, but most things in these that look like carcinoma, if they look like a basal cell carcinoma, probably actually a trichoblastoma. That's kind of my view, and I think, I think most people are now in agreement on that, although not everybody. So in any case, very nice nevus sebaceous, and it's a form of hamartoma, and epidermal nevus is a closely related uh, entity. Okay, case uh, four. Oh, that was the wrong way. I apologize. Okay. Did someone say cylindroma? Yeah. Yeah, that, that looks like cylindroma right here, right? It's very blue and basaloid, and it's got those islands that are molding together like puzzle pieces, or like my former fellow Ed Fulton liked to say, like the spots on a giraffe. And I kind of like that. That's kind of fun. Um, you usually have prominent collagen type 4 basement membrane material. And it is wrapping around, making a thick layer around each of the individual nests. And also often forms these little globules or droplets of hyaline basement membrane material within the um, nests of cells. Um, and then you can see here the little sweat duct lumens. Those are little eccrine ducts with secretion in them. And we always classically teach there are two cell types in, in both cylindroma and its close relative spiradenoma. Sometimes that's easier to see and sometimes it's harder to see. Like here, you can kind of appreciate there's these small dark cells and then the slightly larger, more medium color purple. Um, but I feel like that's kind of a more nuanced thing and I don't find that terribly useful in practice. Um, over here, we have... 
Uh, maybe that's not the best area. Over here, these cells look like the cells of Cylindroma, but instead of being those puzzle piece nests, we've got individual balls or nodules here in the subcutis or in the dermis in some cases. So what's this? A spiradinoma. Yeah, spiradinoma. So spiradinoma and Cylindroma uh, can have overlapping features and often occur uh, together kind of as a hybrid tumor. I'm not entirely sure what's going on in this area here. It almost reminds me of like a follicular tumor, but I don't think that that makes perfect sense unless I've seen sometimes where patients have some syndromes like uh, Brooks-Spiegler syndrome. And there are variants of Brooks-Spiegler where patients, or I've seen patients that developed weird follicular tumors in addition to their spiradinomas and cylindromas. So, you know, uh, follicular and, um, and sweat gland neoplasms and sebaceous neoplasms may sometimes have common embryologic origins and dermatopathologists have been fighting over all of that for years and years. But in any case, it doesn't surprise me to see tumors that have overlapping um, differentiation between hair follicle and sebaceous and sweat gland, because um, it happens. And here, this is another thing that you can see, particularly in spiradenomas, you can get really prominent edema in the background. This is actually dermis here, not sweat duct. This is background dermis with hyalinization around the vessels, and you're having so much edema that it strings out and stretches out the strands of the basaloid tumor cells. This can happen in spiradenomas, and uh, also you can see a prominent um, stromal edema in the background of other um, sweat gland tumors like poromas. All right, uh, case five. Any takers? Uh, sebaceous carcinoma? Yeah, exactly. This looks like a clearly a malignant neoplasm. It's blue and basaloid. Real ugly nuclei there. Let's see if I can get them in better focus. Lots of mitotic activity, mitosis, mitosis, mitosis. Um, and uh, you might think of basal at first, but it doesn't have palisading or clefting or stromal mucin. So we got an ugly kind of basaloid looking tumor. And whenever you see a tumor that looks ugly and basaloid, if you're having trouble telling between basal cell carcinoma and squame because it's so ugly, always think of sebaceous carcinoma. Because looking at this field right here, there's not really much obvious sebaceous differentiation. There may be a little bit of foamy bubbliness, but I don't see well-formed sebocytes. Here you start to get nice, obvious lipid vacuoles that indent the nucleus, although most of the cells are kind of univacuolated and not multivacuolated. So it can sometimes be hard to tell, do I have a squame or some other carcinoma that's got just some clear cell change or vacuolation, or is it actually full-blown true sebaceous differentiation? And I feel like in sebaceous lesions, it's either, usually you can either tell it's malignant, but you're not sure if it's sebaceous versus squame or basal or something else, or you can tell it's sebaceous, but you have trouble deciding if it's malignant or not. So it depends on whether it's kind of a poorly differentiated sebaceous carcinoma like this one, or the well-differentiated ones, which can be hard to tell apart from sebaceous adenoma and sebaceous um, uh, sebaceoma. Look at that atypical mitosis right there. Yikes. Big, huge guy. All right. So uh, muratory syndrome, uh, sebaceous neoplasms are associated with muratory syndrome in some cases particularly if I see them in young people or multiple like sebaceous adenomas or sebaceomas in young people or multiple lesions, I think of that. And also sebaceous carcinomas when they occur off of the head and neck. The ones that occur around the eyelid are usually not associated with muratory. Um, and the ones elsewhere on the head and neck sometimes can be, but still the majority are not. And then elsewhere, like on the trunk or the extremities, the majority are associated with muratory. So that's just kind of a general rule of thumb. But see right here, I mean, that's ugly cells, but you would really have trouble telling it's sebaceous. So you can use a dipophilin to highlight those vacuoles. Um, we've also found that uh, factor 13A, um, AC1A1 clone, only that clone works and it highlights the nuclei of the sebocytes in um, benign and malignant sebaceous proliferations. EMA will stain them, but it's not specific. It stains other stuff too. The reason there are so many stains is that none of them are totally perfect. You know, some of those cells there, I would actually even wonder a bit about Merkel cell at first glance. 
sorry, the second year is we're having microphone issues, but we should be good to go now. So. Oh, we'll great. Ready. Okay, cool. No, no worries. All right. Uh, what do we do with uh, this one? All right. I'll Case take that six. one. So, Paisley tie differential. I was between uh, Desmoplastic Trichoap versus the top of a MAC, but I think I'm leaning more towards Desmoplastic Trichoap. Yeah, I think that's very fair. That is the Paisley tie. It could be tri Desmoplastic Tricoap, could be MAC. You could also think of, of a basal cell. Also, particularly, I would be a little, it doesn't, it, to me, I, I thought the same, that this looks like probably a Desmoplastic Tricoap. But I'm if I don't see the base of the lesion, and I see a shave of what I think is a Desmoplastic Tricoap, I personally will usually add the comment to please do a small excision so I can see the base of the lesion. Because to me, I find that the most useful thing to rule out microcystic adnexal carcinoma, MAC, is to see the base. How deep does it go? And oftentimes in MAC, you're looking for sweat duct differentiation, but it can be very hard to see in the superficial aspect of a MAC. You get these thin basaloid cords. The sweat duct differentiation is not always very obvious, particularly at the superficial aspect. You get keratin microcysts in both desmoplastic trichoap and MAC. So I feel like looking down deep, it helps me to see if there's actual duct formation and also how deep the lesion goes. Desmoplastic trichoap is usually confi confined to the dermis, and MAC usually invades deeper than the dermis, although I've seen exceptions. Um, and uh, you can also, the one immunostain I find helpful here is looking at cytokeratin 20, which will highlight scattered Merkel cell, passenger Merkel cells that like to hang out in benign hair follicle tumors, but are usually missing from MAC or basal cell carcinoma. So that can be kind of helpful. Also, there's a bonus finding here. Look, there's some little round cells in the background. It's a nevus. And there have actually been uh, some papers describing an association of, of nevi, particularly blue nevus, if I recall, with desmoplastic trichoap for some strange reason. They seem to coexist. I do use a little bit more caution in a patient that is old and sun damaged like this. Um, it, before, you know, on a transected shave, just saying, ah, it's a benign hair follicle thing. I want to be really sure I'm not missing an infiltrative basal on someone's nose or a microcystic adnexal carcinoma, both of which will need um, more aggressive uh, treatment, of course. So I find this differential um, of MAC versus desmoplastic trichoap to be very challenging and uh, still a struggle in practice for me. And I think for many people. Dr. Gardner, just a quick question yes. on that. As far as the stroma goes, um, does does that help you differentiate between the Paisley tie differential? Does the stroma help differentiate between the Paisley tie differential? Uh, to some extent, stroma is helpful. I particularly find it helpful in other follicular tumors, like versus basal versus regular trichoap. But in the um, in the setting of MAC, desmoplastic trichoap, infiltrative basal, syringoma, they all have alteration of the background stroma and kind of a sclerotic stroma. And I feel like you don't often like uh, you don't often see really helpful features. Um, papillary mesenchymal bodies, which are a really useful feature for regular trichoepithelioma and sometimes trichoblastoma, in my experience, you don't usually see them in desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So to me, you know, if we look at say other, let's take trichelemoma for example, trichelemoma and desmoplastic trichelemoma. I think of those as the same tumor, just a different morphologic pattern. I think, on the other hand, though, of desmoplastic trichoap as totally separate and probably unrelated to regular tri trichoaps. They look so different, and to me, the reason is when I see a desmoplastic trichoap, I almost never see anything that looks like real classic, regular, conventional trichoepithelioma next to it. Whereas like desmoplastic trichelomoma usually has a background of normal trichelomoma. So I kind of feel like this is an unrelated tumor uh, from regular trichoap. And therefore, all of the stroma tricks that work for regular trichoap versus basal don't work so well here. Um, the one thing I would say is like in distinguishing basal and syringoma, I feel like those two are usually easier to get out of the differential, whereas DTE and MAC are very hard because they can look essentially identical on a small biopsy. Basils usually are going to have some nests that look more like regular basil with palisading, clefting, mucin. Not always, but I feel like oftentimes you'll see some areas that look more like regular basil, or you'll see a combination of a superficial or a nodular pattern with the infiltrative pattern, and that's really helpful to favor basal cell. Syringoma, almost always you're going to see obvious, multiple, clear-cut sweat ducts in even a superficial biopsy of syringoma, whereas that's very rare to see in my experience in a MAC. 
So I feel like syringomas are usually the easiest one to diagnose because you'll see nice tadpole shapes with nice ducts in them. And if you see multiple ducts on a shave, my money would be on syringoma. Again, there are rare exceptions, but that's what I would vote for if I was if I was trying to decide. Thank you. You're welcome. And I've got some videos about some of those entities on my YouTube channel if you want to see some more examples because it's a constant struggle. And again, there are not any real easy answers here. Oh, here, I'll, I'll turn it right side up. Case seven. Um, so this one, I thought sebaceous hyperplasia. Yeah, this is sebaceous hyperplasia. Looks more or less like normal sebaceous glands. They're just big, and there are many of them. And every once in a while, I have a hard time telling apart sebaceous hyperplasia from sebaceous adenoma. Both are benign, but sebaceous hyperplasia is a normal finding in older adults and, and middle-aged adults, too. And, um, and uh, sebaceous adenoma, of course, sometimes is associated with muratory syndrome, which is, you know, uh, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome. So it has some internal potential consequences. The thing that helps me is looking at a thin layer. If you've got a thin layer that's only one or two or three, a few cells thick um, of these blue germinative cells around the periphery, and most of the cells are mature sebocytes, that favors a uh, sebaceous hyperplasia, but occasionally um, it can be kind of a tangential cut uh, or the gland's a little little inflamed or something and it looks a little thicker and I, and I can struggle sometimes deciding between them. But that, uh, this is, I think, a nice sebaceous hyperplasia. And you, as you guys know that these usually are yellowish papules, often on the nose or the cheek, and they often have a little, a little dell or an indentation or umbilication in the middle. And I think you can kind of see that here, this little dip down here. And that usually corresponds to a large central open cystic follicle. So these sebaceous glands all drain into one big follicular space that kind of comes out of the surface. Um, in classic cases, it doesn't always have to do that. Sometimes they're just multiple enlarged lobules around multiple different follicles. It just depends on the situation. Sebaceous hyperplasia, good. Um, okay, no matter what I do, I'm going to always put down the slide upside down the first time, no matter what. Okay, what about this one? This one, again, is a Paisley tie differential. It does have horn cysts. So I guess you, again, could be thinking of a desmoplastic trico up versus the top of a back. Yep, desmoplastic trichoepithelioma versus microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Same differential as the couple cases ago. And again, my vote here personally would be again for desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. Um, although I looked through all of these slides and I did not appreciate anyone that I would definitively call MAC. So I don't know if one of these ended up actually being a MAC. This is not my study set, as you guys know. This is were assembled by Dr. Faringer, and she kindly let us use them. Um, and then, oh, look, you could say here, look, it's a papillary mesenchymal body, right? Sure looks like it, little round cells in the stroma pushing into a basaloid nest. But I think that this is probably not really part of the tumor. This is probably the hair papilla, which is the thing that a papillary mesenchymal body is mimicking, which is at the root of normal hairs. And so these little tiny vellus hairs, if you cut deep enough into them, you're going to see hair papilla. And um, so recognizing the hair papilla or papillary mesenchymal body is super useful in real life practice because when it's in a tumor, that really strongly favors, uh, to me, is essentially definitive for something being a benign follicular tumor. Some people disagree and think that basils can have papillary mesenchymal bodies, but I don't personally believe that. Um, maybe I'll change my mind eventually. But the other thing is it can help you when you're seeing little nests of blue cells in the dermis on a case and you're wondering, is that a hair follicle or a little bit of basal cell carcinoma on a shave biopsy? Once I find the little, the hair papilla, these little stromal cells, that's a, again, that points me to this being a benign hair follicle, uh, not a piece of basal cell. But I think here it's not part of the tumor. And that's the other thing that complicates the workup of hair follicle and sweat gland and sebaceous tumors is sometimes it's hard to tell what's actually part of the neoplasm versus what's an entrapped sebaceous gland or extend, you know, an entrapped um, uh, eccrine duct or background hair follicles. So that can make it a lot more difficult. But I, my vote on this would be favor desmoplastic trichoep. And again, I just add a comment that it's really difficult to definitively exclude microcystic adnexal carcinoma without seeing the base of the lesion. And here what we've had is these, these uh, keratin microcysts, they've ruptured and the keratin has come out and it's made a little keratin granuloma. That's a very common finding in anything that has keratin filled cystic spaces. That includes trichoeps, 
microcystic adnexal carcinoma, squamous cell carcinomas when they rupture and their keratin pearls spill out, that can happen. Um, basically, anytime you have rupture of these keratin cysts, it can produce granuloma and it can also produce calcifications. So I feel like those things are common findings, but not discriminatory findings in telling these entities apart. All right, case uh, nine. So this I was thinking like a cystic sebaceous epithelioma versus even a sebaceous carcinoma. Yeah, so sebaceous epithelioma, I guess, is a term I don't really use. I kind of think of that as analogous to sebaceoma, like kind of like how basal cell carcinoma used to be called basal cell epithelioma. There, it's like a, kind of an older, older term or a term at least that I'm not fam as familiar with how to use. But yeah, that when I looked at this slide, and again, I don't know the history here, just looking at this cold, I either thought this is either a huge sebaceous adenoma or sebaceoma, whichever way you want to put it, or it's a sebaceous carcinoma. I'm actually concerned towards the carcinoma side here, and the reason is because it's so big. And I don't think that that is a firm, fast rule like in the books, but I feel like in real life, I start getting worried, even if something doesn't look really pleomorphic or infiltrative, if I have a really large sebaceous lesion that's pushing deep down, that makes my, my threshold get a lot lower towards calling something malignant or at least saying, hey, it's an, an atypical sebaceous neoplasm and I'm not sure. But this one has got, it doesn't have pleomorphism, but it's got some of the, a lot of those uh, germinative basaloid blue cells with mitotic activity, clear-cut, obvious, mature sebacytes in here. So the sebaceous differentiation is obvious here. No stains needed, right? Those are definitely sebacytes. So the question is then just deciding, is it benign or malignant? I would vote probably towards malignant here, but I could totally see someone saying that they were comfortable with this being a big sebaceous adenoma or sebaceoma with cystic change. Um, so it kind of just depends on your, your threshold and how comfortable you are. Um, and uh, this is one thing I will point out, though. I don't feel that this here is terribly helpful in deciding benign or malignant. It's a bunch of necrosis, right? But look at the cells. They're all dead sebacytes. They're not dead like sheets of those blue basaloid cells. They're dead sheets of bubbly sebacytes. And remember, sebacytes in a normal sebaceous gland are supposed to die, right? That's how sebaceous secretion works. The cells get filled with lipid and get bubbly. They die and they slough off into the secretion. And that's what sebum is made of, the, the husks of dead lipid-filled cells. Kind of gross, right? But that's how it works, is holocrine secretion method. And so sebaceous neoplasms recapitulate that. So to me, I don't personally feel that by itself, dead sheets of sebacytes are super helpful in telling if something is benign or malignant. I think you can see that. Sheets of blue basaloid cells that are necrotic, that starts making me pretty worried. And again, I don't know if anyone has a definitive answer, but this is just the way that I currently think about this and approach it in real life. But uh, in practice, I would probably favor this to be a sebaceous carcinoma, personally, one that is on the very well differentiated end and mimicking sebaceous adenoma or sebaceoma. And also, um, when you see sebaceous neoplasms with big cystic spaces like this in them, that is a stronger indication that the patient may very well have muratory syndrome. Some people have reported that, like sebaceous adenomas that are cystic are often muratory associated. So when I see that, I'll usually mention that in the comment, that that's a particular finding that favors sebaceous, or uh, muratory. Okay. Uh, case 10. Well, I meant to go one minute per slide and clearly failing, so... I'm going to hustle more. Okay. Sebaceous adenoma. Yep. I would call this sebaceous adenoma. It's got sebacytes, mature, bubbly, more than 50%, and it's nice and small, circumscribed, kind of bulging down from the epidermis, and they're often ulcerated and inflamed on top. That doesn't bother me. If it's transected and I'm, I'm a little worried about it, sometimes I'll say, I think it's an adenoma, but I can't see the base. I don't feel like you normally have to excise them, but every once in a while, if I'm a little worried that I might have the top of something worse, I'll mention that to, uh, to the, and ask the derm to please do a small excision. Because I have been burned before, something I thought was sebaceous adenoma, and then it got excised later, and it turned out to be sebaceous carcinoma, but superficially didn't really look atypical. So now if I'm, if I'm worried, then I'll make that comment. All right, what is... See if I can get it right side up. What's this lesion? 
Dilated pore of whiner. Yeah, dilated pore of whiner, or if you like, it is a follicular cyst and fundibular type, or epidermoid cyst, or epidermal inclusion cyst, whatever name you like. I think that the punctum of a follicular cyst, epidermoid cyst, is basically the same thing as a dilated pore. So if it looks like this and doesn't have a nice well-formed cyst underneath, call it dilated pore. Or if you guys as the dermatologist tell me you want a dilated pore and I see that, I'll say dilated pore. If someone says they want a cyst, I'll say fine, it's a cyst. I really think they're two ends of the same spectrum. A dilated hair follicle opening, same kind of lining that looks just like the epidermis. It's got a granular layer usually, loose flaky keratin. It's this, it recapitulates the infundibulum of the follicle, which of course is the part of the follicle that opens out to the skin surface and looks just like the normal epidermis. Um, 12. This looks like a pilomatricoma. Yeah, pilomatricoma, pilomatrixoma, whichever you like. I like how it looks with the X, but it's easier to say with spelling it with the C. And the most helpful clue, of course, is the sheets of ghost or shadow cells. They're sheets of keratinocytes that have died and left behind their, their um, skeletal remains, basically. And you can see where the nuclei were. And then these often calcify and get a lot of calcium in them. And then sometimes even ossify and form nice bone. Um, that happens sometimes. And they are dead keratin, and so the dermis gets very unhappy and makes this very brisk giant cell and histiocytic response. Almost always you're going to see tons of brisk inflammation and giant cell reaction to these. Oh, here's a little bone forming, I think, right here. Oh, no, it's not. It's still just shadow cells. And then the, there are blue basaloid cells that are the matrical component. Sometimes they may be totally absent. Like, I don't see really much of them at all in this. Oh, here's a little bit. Sometimes they may be very focal, and sometimes they can be tons of them. Um, they are matrical cells. They recapitulate the hair follicle root, and so guess what? They're going to have mitotic activity, sometimes tons of mitoses. Do not be afraid. Mitotic activity, even robust mitotic activity, is totally acceptable. I don't want to see pleomorphism, atypical mites, or infiltration way beyond the border of the tumor. Those things make me worry about a malignant pilometricoma or a matrical carcinoma, whichever name you like. Uh, in my experience, with, with once you have practice at recognizing these, if I look at it and it looks like a pilometricoma right away, it's almost always going to be benign. I've seen rare exceptions, but matrical carcinomas to me, usually I look at it and I'm like, ooh, that's an ugly cancer. And then I find focal areas that are making some kind of ghost shadow cells or some inner root sheath trichohyaline granules. So I feel like I start with carcinoma and then eventually see, oh, there's matrical stuff. And then that's when I call it matrical carcinoma. That's just my very, very... Um, you know, loose rule as though that if it looks like a pilometricoma right away, it's the vast majority will be benign. Okay. And, you know, usually they're in kids, but you can have them in adults too. I've even seen older adults with pilometricomas. So don't be afraid. All right. A case 13. What's this? A trichelomoma. Trichelomoma, trichelomoma, whichever one you like. Trichelomoma, if you want, so that you can remember that they can be associated with Cowden syndrome and cows say moo. Some of my fellows have liked that. They um, have a kind of cup shape bulging down into the dermis with these very smooth, uh, smooth borders. And they usually have pale or clear cells. And as we mentioned before, clear in pathology rarely means truly clear. It usually means pale. And so you can see the cells are kind of pale and lighter in color than the normal epidermis. And then you have uh, basal palisading. Usually, there's like a nice palisades along here of lining up cells, usually without a mucin-filled cleft, but I've seen a couple exceptions to that. But usually that's helpful is that you'll either see no cleft and the stroma is tightly associated there. Sometimes you can even see a thick basement membrane, although that doesn't always work here. You can see some basement membrane right here around this little, um, this little uh, blood vessel. The other thing I find really helpful, although I don't know if this case particularly has it. No, not really. The surface usually looks warty. And if you look clinically, when I get trichelomomas, usually the dermatologist has veruca on their differential because they look warty on the top. They get papillomatosis, hypergranulosis, tears of parakeratosis. So if it looks like a wart on the top and then down on the bottom has this basaloid stuff, to me, that's great for trichelomoma. And uh, some people actually believe that they are HPV driven, like that they're basically viral warts uh, that are involving a hair follicle. And so they're recapitulating the outer root sheath with that uh, pale cell appearance and 
the peripheral kind of palisade. There's nice palisading there. So nice for trichelomoma, beautiful and benign. And when multiple, you can think of Cowden syndrome, but the majority I see are just spontaneous and incidental. All right, 14. On this uh, poroma. Poroma, yep. You've got that kind of extending fingers or tongues of tumor coming off the epidermis. They're very round, monotonous cells. Very round and monotonous. Kind of look like the cells of a seborrheic keratosis to me. And then you see ducts, sweat ducts. Sometimes very tiny ones, sometimes bigger dilated ones. And one of the most useful features to me is that usually you can see this very sharp cutoff. The pleroma cells end like right there. And then you're back to normal epidermis. This very sharp cutoff between lesional cells and normal epidermis. I see in pleuromas, clear cell acanthomas can do that um, and some other things. But those are two things I really like. To, that sharp cutoff is very helpful. Very nice. Fifteen. Pilar cyst. Yeah, it's a pilar cyst. And you got to go out here at the edge, and it's a pale, faded slide, but you can see that lining of glassy keratinocytes that are bland, no or minimal granular layer, and then dense keratin in the middle. And this pilar cyst has what in the middle of it? Bone formation. Bone, yeah. And you can tell it's real bone because, look, it's got lamellae. It's been around long enough. It started to form into mature bone. It's got those nice lamellar concentric lines, and it's got little lacunar spaces with tiny little cells in them. Those are osteocytes living in their little lacunar space. Isn't that cute? So that's kind of how you can tell uh, real bone from just calcification is that um, it'll have, if you're, if you're lucky, you'll get those lines, and you'll see osteocytes in it. And depending on if it was decalcified or not, it may be pink or purple or a mixture of those. It kind of depends on the case. All right. Pilar cyst with uh, metaplastic ossification or heterotopic bone, whatever name you like. Okay. Guess, is that it? Okay. We do this. Pilomatricoma. Good. A lot of times people struggle because when they're totally calcified, like this pilomatricoma is when they rupture and totally get calcified, they can get confused with calcinosis cutis because they've got calcium everywhere. And I've definitely had multiple times where I've been able to trick my, my trainees in the past into calling them calcinosis cutis. But looking around, you can see the little ghost shadow cells here, and they're just starting to pick up purple calcium. But those are actually shadow cells, ghost cells. There's more of them here. So even just finding a little bit of those ghost or shadow cells is, is almost definitive for pilometricoma, with very, very few exceptions. So even if I don't see anything else, that's, a, to me, enough to strongly suggest something's a pilometricoma. And they can have extensive calcification. And then this one actually is probably forming into real bone. It's just hard to see here because it's not decalcified at all. 17. Yeah, mixed tumor or chondroid syringoma. It's a nice circumscribed nodule, and it's got all sorts of craziness going on in it. So sometimes these have a wide range of features. If you see an adnexal tumor that you're like, I don't really know what that is, always think of mixed tumor. They um, have ducts, often lined by double-layer cuboidal epithelium because they're recapitulating sweat ducts. The stroma itself can vary from fibrous to mixoid to fatty to cartilaginous to even having true bone and everywhere in between. Okay, and these tumors have both epithelial and myoepithelial cells in varying amounts, and they exist on a spectrum with myoepithelioma. And these are kind of similar or analogous to um, what we call pleomorphic adenoma in the parotid gland, um, which is a salivary gland mixed tumor. So wide range of features. Sometimes they have keratin-filled cysts and hair follicle differentiation. Usually sweat gland differentiation is the more predominant feature. Chondroid syringoma or mixed tumor. But they don't have to have cartilage, which is why I don't really like the name chondroid syringoma, because they don't really look like a syringoma, and they're not always chondroid. OK. 
Okay, um, 18. Pilar cyst. Yeah, pilar cyst. There it is again. Or trichelemal cyst, if you like that name better. That's the perfect trichelemal lining. And this one has just got a bunch of calcification. Calcification very common in pilar cysts. Uh, 19. Infundibular cystic basal cell. Yeah, I would call this a basal cell carcinoma that has kind of follicular differentiation or infundibulocystic, if you like. And these tend to have kind of a branching antler-like pattern, um, if you like. And they also tend to have uh, cystic spaces that have um, keratin in them that are kind of uh, analogous to the infundibulum of the hair follicle. So that's what I would call this. In practice, I personally just usually call this basal cell carcinoma, nodular type. Um, because not everyone's as familiar with the term infundibular cystic, but I think of them as basically a variation on nodular basal cell carcinoma, uh, personally. Okay, what about that one? With the horizontal pattern of growth, it could be a tumor of follicular infundibulum, but I mean, I was considering like a reticulated seb type pattern or something more reticulated. Great. So uh, tumor of the follicular infundibulum, TFI, as I like to call it, or um, or maybe a seb. And I think that TFIs look a lot like seborrheic keratosis. They have this similar kind of uh, small... Uh, keratinocyte cells that are pink. Usually this one's a little faded, so it looks more blue. But I, I think the key is to me that the epidermis is basically normal here, right? And it, the proliferation, instead of growing up on top or, it, or filling the epidermis and extending down like a seb would usually do, this actually is skipping and branching either from reedy or from openings of hair follicle to the next opening of a hair follicle. And again, the opening of a hair follicle, these are the infundibula. So this is growing from infundibulum to infundibulum to infundibulum as a kind of a, a horizontal plaque. And I feel like that's the most helpful thing uh, to making a diagnosis of tumor of the follicular infundibulum. And let me show you, I've got another one that I pulled out the other day that Dr. Melrose, our fellow, um, was asking about. That's melanoma up there. But that, this is a little bit more pink. Isn't that nice? See how it makes like this horizontal plaque under the epidermis, right? It's skipping along from hair follicle to hair follicle to hair follicle to the next. And it's not always like perfect because, you know, it's kind of, it's a three-dimensional structure. We're just cutting a, a one slice through it. But I, I feel like most often when I see them, they're incidental findings in the background of like a melanoma biopsy or excision. I rarely get them as the only finding, but I think this is one of the nicer ones that I've seen. Um, really, really cute little uh, entity. I like tumor follicular infundibulum. In my opinion, these are benign. I, I believe I've read some stuff that some people think they're a variant of basal, but then the pictures that they showed in their paper, I was like, that's a basal. I wouldn't call that TFI. So, you know, the take-home story is that, you know, naming stuff particularly for adnexal tumors is filled with controversy and debate. And a lot of times the names that are used in the literature are not pure, it, meaning that some people have used them one way and then others have used them a different way. And then that's where you'll look up, you know, pilometrical carcinoma. And some studies will say it's got a really high rate of mortality and others say it's really low, probably because not all those studies are describing the same thing. So, okay, what about this one? How do we differentiate between like pilosebaceous induction, like follicular induction? Oh, in the last case, so how to how to differentiate from follicular induction? Well, follicular induction usually is going to have, um, I don't have a case of that handy. This one does look a touch more basally than usual, but but if you take that pink one that I showed you, I would say that the this is this is pink. Whereas when you get induction change in the epidermis, like over a dermatofibroma, you usually have, they usually look very blue and basaloid. They're, they're the root of the hair follicle. That's, that's the most prominent part that we see when we see the induction phenomenon. And, um, and oftentimes too, the stroma underneath will start to get cellular and coalesce and make like a little papillary mesenchymal body kind of imitating the hair papilla. So I feel like that's kind of the most helpful thing. I, I wish I had a case uh, pulled to show you, but also it wouldn't matter either way, right? Cause it's totally benign. So I know for, for learning purposes, it's good to distinguish, but in real life practice, 
uh, TFI, I mean, often I, if it's an incidental finding, I don't usually even mention it. I just point it out excitedly to the fellow, and then we move to the next case. But that's a good question. Okay. Uh, what were you? Oh, 21. So I thought this one was a little bit tricky, but I landed on like an infiltrative BCC. It looks kind of nasty and spiky in certain areas. Yeah. Infiltrative basal cell is exactly what I'd call this, or morphia form if you, if you like that term better. And, you know, you can have little keratin-filled cysts in basal cell. I see it all the time. Sometimes I'll even mention that there's some squamous or keratinizing differentiation or squamous metaplasia, whatever. I don't think that's probably technically a correct term, but I do say that sometimes. And the main reason I mention that is not because I think it means anything, but just so the Mohs surgeon, if they see keratinization, they know, oh, yeah, this is, this is not a squam. It's actually a basal. And what, what helps here is this. Look, we've got some obvious superficial basal over here. Now, you could have basal colliding with some other tumor, but I feel like when you see merging of obvious basal into these little infiltrative cords, and look how cellular and very busy the stroma is. So one of you earlier asked about the stroma. The stroma of infiltrative basal is, I think, a bit different than the stroma of the other paisley tie things like syringoma, desmoplastic trichope, and MAC. They all tend to have very dense pink sclerotic stroma, whereas in infiltrative basals, it's often a bit more fiber, fibroblast rich. It's a lot more spindle cells, and it's often kind of bluish mucin-y mixed in. It's not as pink and dense. It's a little bit more, uh, more bluish and, and busy stroma in infiltrative basals. So yeah, I would call that an infiltrative basal. Good. I'm going to try to move faster so we can get all of these done. Okay. This is 22. Um, so this one was the rolls and scrolls of like a prolifer proliferating pilar cyst. Yeah, proliferating pilar cyst or tumor, proliferating trichelemal tumor, cyst, whatever name you like. Here looks just like a pilar cyst, just like the other ones we've seen. And then within that, you have a proliferation of the lining. And sometimes if you don't see the obvious pilar cyst in the background and you just see this, you might start thinking about squamous cell carcinoma. And some people have proposed that these are all malignant. I, I don't personally believe that. But um, they are very busy and they can look kind of scary sometimes. And yeah, what you tend to see is these, um, these little uh, folds and, and uh, loops of the epidermal stuff kind of, kind of turn in little rolls and scrolls. This one is not as perfect, but it kind of curves and twists around and wraps up that, um, that dense keratin inside um, these little um, swirls and rolls of epithelium. But basically, if you see a pilar cyst, and then a proliferation of bland, glassy keratinocytes growing in the middle of it. That's a proliferating pilar tumor. And in the middle, they can look very busy and almost infiltrative. But if you see the whole border of the tumor, it's actually very smooth on the outside. So if you just get a curette of this, someone thinking it's a cyst or something, it can be really hard to tell for sure that it's a benign thing. But when you can see a bigger um, a section of it and you can see the smooth border, that's helpful. And this is a nice example of keratin granuloma in the middle there. Um, and those look also very similar to cholesterol crystals. Um, they can both make these very nice cleft-like, slit-like spaces with the granulomas background. Excellent. 23. Trichoep. Trichoepithelioma. It's basaloid, but it's got a nice cellu cellular stroma around it, and the stroma hugs tightly to the nests of tumor cells. There's not clefting and mucin. What instead you see is the stromal cells wrapping around the nest. I find that to be one of the most helpful features to decide that something's a benign follicular tumor like trichoep, um, is that the stroma clings to the tumor nests usually, whereas in basal it kind of separates away in a basal cell carcinoma. And if you're lucky, you'll find some papillary mesenchymal bodies. I've seen a couple in here, but let me find a, a good one. Uh, it's hard to find the the papillary mesenchymal body with a capital P as one of my, again, it was Ed Fulton who said that. We wrote a paper together on indexal tumors, a review article in Archives of Pathology 2019. Um, in any case, uh, well, I'll have to find one later. I'm sorry, I should have dotted it. But in any case, papillary mesenchymal bodies are not always present, but when you have them, it's very helpful. Um, and the cellular stroma clinging to the nests of tumor cells is, I think, the most helpful feature, though. I don't find myto mitotic activity or apoptotic dying cells in the tumor to be a terribly useful discriminator. Um, I guess unless it's like florid atypical mitotic activity, that might make me 
um, think twice, but uh, 24. Well, if I can, there we go. Sebaceous carcinoma. Well, I guess maybe, but I, I thought this just looked like squam in situ. But, but it's pretty faded. And, you know, I see a lot of squam in situs that have bubbly cyto, uh, cytoplasm. And I, people have described sebaceous carcinoma as in situ only. But I've, I see this phenomenon so often, little lipid bubbles in like bowenoid looking squam in situ that I've just basically come to disregard it. I used to stain it sometimes. And if it really is sebaceous differentiation, then I would say that I see in situ sebaceous carcinoma like several times per week. And that just seems unlikely to me. So I've just come to accept that you can get lipid bubbles in some squam in situ. I don't know if that's right, but that's the way I regard it. Um, if I have invasive sebaceous carcinoma and then I see in situ carcinoma next to it, then I'll say, well, hey, that probably is in situ growth of the sebaceous carcinoma. But usually I personally like to see invasion before calling something sebaceous carcinoma. And other people may totally disagree with that, but that's been the approach I've taken. So take it with a handful of salt. Okay, 25. Come on. It's hard to do 37 cases in an hour, guys, and I'm, I'm talking as fast as I can. Uh, this looks good for another uh, nevus sebaceous. Yeah, this is a, a much more subtle nevus sebaceous. The epidermis is barely acanthotic at all, but you do have sebaceous glands underneath, and they are emptying directly to the surface. So just a good example of the, the range of features you can see in nevus sebaceous. They're not always so florid and beautiful as that first one. They can be subtle. Twenty-six. Uh, looks like a trichofolliculoma. Yeah, there's two different approaches you could take here. You could call this a trichofolliculoma that you got the central hair follicle and lots of little hair follicles emptying into it. Um, uh, the, you know the hen and chicks or the mother follicle and the baby follicles. Or if you like, you could focus on this fact that there's a lot of mature sebaceous glands here, and you could say it's a sebaceous trichofolliculoma which uh, the other name for that is um, a folliculosebaceous cystic hamartoma. So if you like that, it's a very long name. I think that those two entities, again, like many of the follicular family, uh, are, are on a close related spectrum. So I think either trichofolliculoma or folliculosebaceous cystic hamartoma would both be acceptable terms here. And I would point out from low power, look at this. You can see the border of the lesion is right here because it has its own stroma. That dense stroma that hugs around it is clearly distinct from the background dermis, and I find that such a useful feature in follicular neoplasms. Uh, 27. Uh, this looks like uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma. That's what I call it. I don't see anything fancy or special here. Just good old fashioned invasive squamous cell carcinoma with keratin pearls. Um, I guess I will bring up this while we're here. What's this? That's cancer, but this is not. This is just can a normal- Can you point to it again? Sorry, I can see No, it. no, go ahead, say it. Uh, sorry, I couldn't see it. Can you point to that again? Oh yeah, exactly. this right here. kind of weird, yeah. right? It's got ducts in it. Ducts in it, yeah. So is that evidence that it's a eccrine carcinoma or something? No, I don't think so. I think this is cancer back here. This is a normal, well, not a normal. It used to be a normal eccrine duct, but when eccrine ducts get either cut or irritated or inflamed, they tend to get squamous metaplasia. They get benign, but sometimes glassy looking even. These aren't very glassy, but they get a proliferation of their lining cells. And sometimes they can become quite squamoid. You see that in biopsy sites, like under a melanoma biopsy site, you can see these things that look like squamous cell carcinoma, but have little ducts in the middle. So this is what we call uh, syringometaplasia. Um, and I think it's an important thing to recognize in practice for Dermpath because we do see this a lot and it can mimic cancer sometimes. Here, it's a totally incidental thing that I wouldn't even mention, but I thought it was a little pearl that I would teach you guys since we're doing intermediate level stuff today. You're ready for it. You're ready to learn about syringometaplasia. All right, what's this? Uh, that looks like an SCAP. Yeah, SCAP, SCAP, syringocystadenoma papilliferum. You've got these 
finger-like, you've got a kind of bulging epidermal surface with cleft-like invaginations that branch down into little ducts into the dermis. And within those open luminal ductal spaces, you have papillae floating in the middle, and the papillae are lined by double layer of columnar cuboidal epithelium, sometimes with apocrine snouts. And one of the very nice features is that usually, oh, sorry, uh, the slide fell into the middle of the microscope. There. Usually, there are loads of plasma cells in the cores of these papillary structures. So that's very helpful. You can see that there's sweat ducts right there. And then also, look what this is. What are these? What kind of glands? They look like apocrine. They're apocrine glands, yeah. Sometimes you can see these really bright little granules in them. I'm not sure what those are, but they're often there. You can see the eyeball, the minion eyeball sign, right? See, it's like these big eyeballs staring back at us. So apocrine glands, well, if this is on the scalp, guess what this means? This is probably a scap arising in a nevus sebaceous, which is what often happens. They often do arise in nevus sebaceous, and probably this background warty-looking stuff is probably a component of nevus sebaceous. So anytime I see scap, I go looking for background nevus sebaceous because it's often present. Doesn't necessarily matter, but it's just kind of an interesting thing to point out. Uh, 29. This one has a big cystic space, but I thought it looked like a hydradenoma when you get closer and look at the cells. Yes, this is a big cystic space, but the lining is a lot thicker than the lining of most cysts. And it's made of kind of uniform keratinocyte-like cells that are kind of small and round and look, in fact, quite like, in this case, quite like the cells of a poroma. And so this is a hydradenoma nodular and cystic hydradenoma. They're sometimes called because they can either be big nodules, big cysts, or usually a combination of those. Their cells are usually pink and kind of squamoid looking or keratin keratinocyte looking uh, rather than the blue basaloid cells that you'd see in spiradenoma and cylindromas. They're blue and these are usually pink. Sometimes they have real prominent clear cell change, like actual real optically clear. I've seen cases of hydradenoma that mimicked metastatic renal cell carcinoma and were misdiagnosed as such. There's very dense basement membrane material in here, which is a common feature for a wide variety of adnexal uh, tumors and the cystic spaces are common. So this is hydradenoma, and I believe that these are very closely related to poroma. Poroma, hydradenoma, and a few other entities are part of what I believe the acrospiroma family is the kind of way I like to conceptualize those. Uh, 30. So this looked like a like a four-day spot with like mucosal surface in the sebaceous lens. Yes, very good. Recognizing that we're on squamous mucosa is the first step. It's clear glycogenated squamous epithelium with um, without a granule layer. And then you've got sebaceous glands in this squamous mucosa. So sebaceous glands that occur inside the uh, mouth and the lip or the, the inside of the the cheek, the buccal mucosa, or on the penis or the vulva, those are called four dice spots, and they're just a normal finding that are present in the vast majority of adults. Just mature sebaceous glands hanging out in those mucosal sites. And also, if you have mature sebaceous glands hanging out around the nipple, what are those called? Montgomery tubercles. Montgomery tubercles. Very good. Normal finding. 31. So this will look like an accessory nipple. Oh, very good. The key is right there. This is accessory nipple. Here we are on trunk skin. And then down here, these ducts that look kind of like sweat ducts, but not really. And they've got kind of like a little bit of a star-shaped lumen. And they're surrounded by this kind of dense stroma. Those are, those are breast ducts, okay? Those are analogous to the, um, the lactiferous ductules that are seen in the nipple. And then up here... There's smooth muscle, a lot of smooth muscle. See all these little pale pink bundles? Those are smooth muscle bundles, as we would see in the areola or nipple. And also, look, there's a sebaceous gland. It's a Montgomery tubercle. So this, you can sometimes have varying amounts of all these things. Sometimes you just see the muscle, and sometimes the ducts are real prominent. So anytime you see a combination of these features um, on the chest away from the nipple, think about an accessory nipple. The surface can also be papillomatous sometimes. Uh, 
32. Wow, a classic beauty. I love these. They're so rare. Trico adenoma. Trico adenoma. A bunch of small keratin filled cysts all packed together with very minimal basaloid component. Um, uh, my uh, mentor, Doug Parker at Emory, he said it's like if you go to like the, the hardware store and you see a bunch of pipes, you know, of different size all stacked and you're looking at them on end, that that's what Trico adenoma looks like. A bunch of different size PVC pipe all stacked together. And I thought that was kind of fun. That's a real beauty of a Trico adenoma. 33. Uh, this one is favorite, papillary eccrine adenoma. Papillary eccrine adenoma, very good. And there's another entity that I think is very closely related, tubular apocrine adenoma. I think that there's a lot of overlap and that those two entities probably are very closely related. At least I have trouble distinguishing them. And as you can tell, if I have trouble distinguishing something, I just say, oh, they're closely related rather than admit that I'm just not good at telling them apart. So that's, that's the way I, I deal with that. Okay, the key to these is that they, they have lots of tubules, but the tubules are, instead of filled with keratin, like in that trichoadenoma, they're filled with secretion. It's dried up, kind of thick sweat secretion. They have a double layer of cuboidal lining, like sweat glands do. And then some of them will have little proliferating tufts or papillae or micropapillae of cells pushing into the lumen, okay? And the, in the middle, they can look very infiltrative. Right? All the, it looks very busy, but if you look again from low power, the actual outside of the lesion is relatively circumscribed. The one thing I would use caution is if you see stuff that looks like this and you're on the acral surface, always keep digital papillary adenocarcinoma in mind. I have seen these on acral skin, but I've made that diagnosis with, with great caution and trepidation because it's easy to miss digital papillary adenocarcinoma if you're not familiar with it because it doesn't usually look cytologically atypical or malignant, and they can behave in a, in a malignant fashion and cause big problems. So um, this is a good one to know, but if you can't see the whole lesion, it's one where I, I might want a complete excision just so I can see the periphery of the lesion and assess and make sure it's circumscribed. So papillary eccrine adenoma. 34. Let's think of other nevus sebaceous. Beautiful. Nevus sebaceous. And in this one, I think there's some more prominent basaloid stuff that you could either call basaloid follicular induction or trichoblastoma component or trichoepithelioma, or some people might want to call it basal cell, although it doesn't have clefting. This almost actually looks more like trichelemoma here. So you often have this mixture, or I, I've sometimes, it's like a melange, a mixture of all these different types of sweat gland um, and hair follicle proliferations growing in the midst of uh, nevus sebaceous. I have actually signed out report as nevus sebaceous with a variety of background benign um, um, at nexal tumors, because if it was taken off by a surgeon, I didn't want to go naming all these weird names just to say, look, there's a bunch of weird stuff that dermpaths like. It doesn't matter at all for the patient. So it's like a variety pack. And then let's see here, 35. Uh, this one is uh, desmoplastic trichelimuma. Trichelimuma, I like that, Oksana, good. Yes, this is trichelimoma, trichelimuma. It pushes down, it's basaloid, it's got pale cells like so. This one, the cells are almost actually getting clear, getting close to it. And a little bit of palisading and, okay, it's gonna have to be crooked, I'm sorry. I can't get it to sit on there without falling. In the middle though, it's quite busy, right? In the middle, if you just looked at that at high power, I mean, you'd say that's infiltrative basal cell carcinoma or something similar. The stroma tends to be a little bit more dense, but not always. I, I've seen ones where the middle looks, there's no way to me, if I just saw a little piece of that, that I would re be able to be sure that it was a trichelomoma and not a basal or a squam. So this is one of these uh, things that is a splitting for pathologists to know this is a weird variant, but it's still totally benign. I oftentimes will actually not mention this in the report because I don't want the, desmoplastic is kind of a scary word, right? And I don't want my dermatologist to be like, oh, does that mean I need to do something? No, these are benign. There are some times though where I'll mention if it's a partial biopsy and say, I think it's desmoplastic trichelomoma, but I'm not sure there could maybe be infiltrated basal. And the key to me is seeing the periphery or the base of the lesion. So sometimes even if I don't see the base, let me turn it here. If I see 
this infiltrative stuff, but on the outside, I see that nice palisading without a cleft and the pale cell change. Like if I just saw this area, that would be very suggestive that this is actually just a desmoplastic trichelomoma and not a basal cell. But a biopsy from the center would be real hard to tell for sure. So uh, that's the key is this, the periphery looks like trichelomoma. The middle looks like almost like infiltrated basal. The surface often of all trichelomomas is often warty and verrucous in appearance. 36, we're almost there. Oh, another beauty. Wow. Um, this looks like a cutaneous lymphadenoma with the blue islands and black speckled lymph cells. Very nice. Cutaneous lymphadenoma, or some people believe that these are a variant of trichoblastoma. I'm not totally sold on that, and um, I know some others who are not as well, but it doesn't matter, again, what name you want to call it. It's a benign thing, and um, this is, the key is that you've got these islands, and they're kind of basaloid, but instead of being filled with normal basal cells, like uh, basaloid keratinocytes, instead they're packed full of a mixture of cells, mostly histiocytes and lymphocytes. So you get these big, let's get close enough here, if you did a keratin stain, you'd see these cells around the outside and some of the middle cells are actually epithelial cells. But most of these big pale guys are histiocytes and then the little tiny really dark guys are lymphocytes. And each nest of the tumor is packed full of histiocytes and lymphocytes like a cannoli, like, you know, those, those nice little Italian desserts that are filled with the creamy uh, center and the outside's a kind of crunchy shell. And so people have uh, made the analogy that these are like cannolis. And I quite like that, and now I'd really like to have a cannoli. So in any case, a cutaneous lymphadenoma, quite rare. I, I only encounter these maybe once every year or so, in my practice at least. Um, so I'm always really happy when I see them. And I'll always remember it because I was previewing cases when I was rotating with Dr. Rapini, one of my very favorite Dermpath mentors when I was a resident. And I was looking at cases, and I, I wrote one of these up as a basal cell carcinoma. And he said, oh, he said, Jared, you missed the chance to make a really cool diagnosis. And this is actually not a basal cell. It's a, it's a cutaneous lymphadenoma. And so I have a bit of shame from that. Maybe that's, that's deep-seated. But my wife is a psychiatrist, and she'll figure out how to fix that someday. So in any case, they'll always remember that. You, you remember the things you miss, you know? So make sure you make your mistakes now during these conferences. It's a great way to learn. You'll remember the shame maybe for a long time, but I won't. I'll never shame you for it. Okay. One final one to end on. Just like a clear cell acanthoma. Clear cell acanthoma. Benign and beautiful. Yep. And it's another one that's got that, you can see that's where the lesion ends. It's just this super sharp cutoff. Sometimes you can see a couple cutoffs, like right here. See, it has like one area here. It's sharply cut off. Then it stops. Normal epidermis. And then it goes back <clears throat> into more of the lesion. I've seen that happen multiple times before. You get acanthosis. Pallor, often with spongiosis. Some people like to call these pale cell acanthoma because of the, they're not really clear again, but um, we have lots of things that are misnomers in pathology, so I just accept it. And then the epidermis at the top lacks a granular layer, has parakeratosis, and usually has scattered neutrophils. So it really has a lot of features, neutrophils here too, a lot of features similar to psoriasis in a way. It's like a single plaque of pale epidermis with psoriasis-like changes. Often, in, in my experience, they're often on like the shin, the lower leg. But the other thing is, I think that no one ever taught me this that I can recall, but sometimes clear cell acanthoma and trichelomoma and inverted follicular keratosis can have overlapping features. So I feel like I've had multiple cases where I've ended up with those three entities in my differential diagnosis. Um, you know, if it's on the face, it's probably less likely to be a clear cell acanthoma. They're all benign things, it doesn't matter. But I feel like I've seen plenty of cases where those kind of mimicked each other and I never thought of those three things in a differential together. Obviously this one's clear cut, no, um, no pun intended, but an easy diagnosis to make here. And with that, 11 minutes late only, which for me is like being early, have a nice Friday and enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.